I'd like to thank Parg and all his colleagues who organized the uh, Dublin Transcribathon. Uh, I also want to thank all of you participants um, on such an unpleasant day. Um, I have my window open, hopefully there's no noise for the moment. Um, to share some thoughts completely different from the fabulous previous talk we had uh, about the Wide Streets Commissions. So I'm just going to explain a little bit about my background to my interest in Daniel O'Connell, to this kind of interface between the work of archivists, but particularly digital humanities, and what to me is the most important for this particular source or story, as the uh, website calls it, in other words, a very simple source, the minutes of Dublin City Council, and I'm only going to concentrate for reasons I'll explain on the first year, November 1841 to November 1842. So originally I'm half French. I was a specialist of French-Irish relations of the United Irishmen in France, but then as it happens, you you know, you were asked to teach particular teaching modules. And all of a sudden I found myself teaching a course on Daniel O'Connell. At the time it was a full year course in Trinity, which meant the students and I really had a lot of time to explore an awful lot. And an aspect of Irish history that had always intimidated me a little bit because I sensed the presence of bishops looking everyone, over everyone's shoulder. Uh, I was absolutely astounded at how utterly exciting this period was. And what we're also gonna think about is that we learn very little from the actual source we're gonna be thinking about today. It's quite dry. There's very little of political excitement happening in it. Um, the other aspect is what I'm going to call hero history. And you see this exceptional portrait of a man who was groundbreaking and a game changer. Uh, but in later years, not so much at the moment, you know, with Mick Collins and De Valera, people are less afraid of what I'm going to call hero history. But even a few years ago, I'm still not 100% convinced there was a huge amount of fuss and then anti-fuss about Constance Markovitz. I'm not sure to what extent people understand how admired she was during her lifetime and even before the rising. So when you go back to someone like Daniel O'Connell, who seems to represent a certain kind of, it's as good as we're gonna get at the moment type history, uh, he attempts to appeal the act of union probably as some kind of political, uh, theatrical strategy, knowing it's not going to come about. And he is later seen to have failed to have done this. I think that's the wrong approach. You need to think of the, the dynamism of his political agitation. And you need to think of young men growing up during this time, for example, many of whom who will become Fenians and members of the IRB. So we're going to go back to this period. The second thing is we had with the Irish Association of Professional Historians, um, of which I'm very proud to be a member, an association that's growing and changing as, as our lives change. Uh, we had last year a really important workshop on the archive and the historian. And Many of my colleagues have gone on from what I'm going to call conventional history and paper history to do librarian studies, to do the digital humanities, and to do archival studies. And I think we need to be frank about this. It's very often uh, because there might be remunerated work at the end of it. So they're enhancing their skills. Um, we now have a huge amount of material that's transcribed 
But as we see with the transcribathon, and I had never done anything like the very little bit that I did um, during a very intense week in March um, in terms of the enhancements, transcribing is easy. Uh, I've been doing a huge amount of that because a lot of what I've done in my research is not published. It's not even typed, it's all manuscript uh, work. So um, learning how, I had to learn backwards. I didn't have time to attend the seminars and very often it's only when you about transcription <laughs> that you begin to click right, left, center and learn this works. Uh, the story, what they're calling the story to me is actually the digitized document. It's a register book of uh, Dublin City Council minutes um, and it's going to be transformed into a story. So there's all this extra added language. Um, the final thing is, is that I'm not a specialist of municipal government. I am in a little while going to introduce you to an excellent thesis which really helped me understand the background to this um, particular year in the life of the new Dublin City Council. Um, again, I think O'Connell might be misunderstood, slightly brushed aside today. And I think nowadays everyone has a, a healthy appetite in learning about history and in learning on what a lot of us call missing years history when nothing apparently earth shattering seems to happen. So O'Connell's elected, he becomes a member of parliament, Catholic emancipation goes through. The next major step, and that's the, the precise context for him being elected Lord Mayor is of course, the change in municipal government laws in the United Kingdom, uh, removing the impediment for anyone who wasn't uh, of the established church to hold municipal um, office. So on this introductory slide, this is practically the only image I'm going to give you of the document, which is now digitized and up on the DRI uh, volume 11. In other words, the first volume of the new Dublin City Council after the 1840 uh, Municipal Reform Act. As you can see, and I'm pretty sure it's more or less the same handwriting throughout, an extremely, extremely clear handwriting. And later on, we'll look at that transcribed text. Uh, it's the election um, of O'Connell as Lord Mayor. So you see a magnificent, it's an early 20th century portrait of O'Connell as a Lord Mayor with his wonderful robes and the chain of office. But we're gonna to move to slide number two, Parig, if you uh, move us to slide number two. Okay, so this is in the National Library of Ireland. It has no date. It's a much rougher um, artistic rendering. Uh, it's not incredibly skilled, but you do have a few more accoutrements. So the chain of office, the big deal, as you know, is that it has King William III, King Billy, uh, the first and most significant of Orangemen um, who would introduce a series, a process uh, which we call the penal laws, which would disenfranchise Catholics from uh, holding public office. So in the middle of the chain is an oval with King William and O'Connell of course was teased about it and he commented on it. Uh, but he said, I've kind of won it back. So he's wearing a, a very, no, no, can we go backwards? Rope. Okay. To the, uh, in, in great detail on this, uh, you have uh, the sword of office, the mace, but look, isn't that charming? Up in the scroll in the back, leaning on the column are the three castles, uh, which to this day, very modernized are the logo of the city of Dublin. So I just thought it was really nice to have that image with all this in this august setting with drapery and a column. And we'll return to the setting all the way at the end when we look at the last image of O'Connell. But it's very nice to see that branding now of the three castles. Okay, we're gonna move on to the next slide, Parag number three and the context. Okay, so very simply, 
um, Municipal Corporations Reform Act Ireland, because they had voted in before in England, 1840, among other things, religion is taken out of municipal politics and holding office. So the office of the Lord Mayor. So we really need to look every now and again at broader English history, um, at what more, let's say, left-leaning people in England would look at, how many towns and cities in the north of England, not to mention Scotland, where you would have had dissenters, um, you know, holding office. Much later, you're going to get people left-leaning. In any event in Ireland, where a majority are Catholic, you would have had no Catholic mayors. And finally, this is going to kick in. So the laws voted in. The first Municipal election is held for over several weeks in October in 1841. And then the new council meets on the 1st of November and Daniel O'Connell is sworn in. Now they don't say this obviously in the register as the first Catholic Lord Mayor of Dublin since Terence McDermott way back in 1689. He wears the chain of office and comments on it. And we need to return to the peripheral comments to what's going on in the document which was digitized. Um, now another thing, and this is what partially drew my interest to it. So this particular act in Dublin, I don't know about what would have gone on in, in, in Great Britain. Um, this particular act abolishes the ancient swearing in of the Lord Mayor by the Viceroy in the presence chamber in Dublin Castle. So Myself in a piece, quoting someone else, I said the theater of politics was robbed of a considerable scene. So the book that I contributed um, a chapter to, Making Majesty, was put together by the curators in Dublin Castle who looked at the history of the throne room. Now it goes all the way up to the uh, age of independence and even after when it was used by the courts after the fire in the forecourts. But when I was teaching, I remembered there was a particular melee, a particular incident, and it caused a huge stir at the time. It was when O'Connell was Lord Mayor, a new Viceroy arrived in Ireland, de Grey, a conservative, um, and it was the custom for any dignitary, but particularly the Lord Mayor, to come to the first levee, the first public audience. So what happened was, was that because there were so many people in the street and the Lord Mayor's coach, uh, the gingerbread coach, which you might have seen on certain days outside the mansion house, uh, was held up in the streets. But to make a very long story short, uh, O'Connell was later accused of having been deliberately late uh, to have kind of stolen the show from the Viceroy. So I was able to embed that into that chapter and the curators in Dublin Castle putting this book together were absolutely delighted uh, because there's a bit of satire and irony and you were able to look at, at a, you know, a much more raw popularized version. But the procession of the Lord Mayor's carriage that day up to Dublin Castle, I, I think needs to be even just worked up in illustrations in a picture book for children, because it really was quite extraordinary. So getting back to what we're concerned with today, it was on the 17th of November. So it literally was within the first few weeks of O'Connell's mayoralty and I wanted to see if anything was mentioned in the book, but in the register of the minutes, and needless to say, it's quite dry and it sticks to the business, the order of the day, and not with peripheral municipal um, politics. So um, if we move on to slide number four, Parag. Thank you. So it's easy for me to say, what do we find in this particular source? Um, I'm very quickly gonna say, how does it disappoint us? Depending on your approach. And my approach had already been to look at a very contentious, melodramatic rendering in the press 
of what O'Connell that day may or may not have done, you know, as a deliberate affront to the Viceroy, which he certainly uh, denied. So the minute books of Dublin City Council, I only looked at volume 11, the mayor is elected for one year, in this case, November 1841 to November 82. They're extremely dry and cursory. Actually, a minute taker would tell you they're very professionally done. There's absolutely no fluff, no debate. It's just uh, a very uh, accurate, uh, but very concise record. So I haven't yet decided what or if I will do with this, but certainly to prepare this talk today, um, I had to do a lot of lateral research. It's great, I kind of felt like a student or preparing a class for my students again. I had to learn, acquire a lot of peripheral knowledge uh, to broaden my understanding of the very basics of this interface between Dublin City Council and this formidable person, O'Connell, who was already an extraordinary figure uh, in Irish politics. A hundred years later, you can compare him to de Valera for completely different reasons. So very important for us to understand, and I learned this in the past week preparing this, Dublin City Council had very limited control and functions over broader um, institutions. So it did not have the right to appoint city magistrates. They tried to, and that's in this book, and that's in a thesis that is um, the most concise uh, piece of writing I've seen that can help us understand this. Um, the Lord Lieutenant, the Viceroy, will appoint the city magistrates and will choose only Orangemen. The Dublin City Council, the new one despite the reforms, the ballast board, the paving commissioners, the police commissioners, the wide streets commission, which we've already seen, those exceptionally beautiful and compelling images that need a huge amount of deconstruction, but that are so visually part of the history of Dublin. Uh, the term grand juries, all of those institutions and functions are outside the control of this new reformed Dublin City Council. So apologies, I, I forgot to add that in. They will administer justice. So O'Connell will have a role as a magistrate. Uh, they control the markets. So that could be interesting to see. Our instinct would be to look, are there subcommittees? I didn't, none of this is too obvious uh, to see anything having to do with the Dublin markets. Where were they? What were the issues? And of course, the provision of water, the piping of water into the city. So that's a big deal. And that pops up a lot in the minutes. There's an almost total absence of political or party arguments in this particular source. So there are no actual stories. I know the Europeana platform refers to what I call a document as a story. Um, but there are no stories in here. You have to look for them somewhere else. The contemporary press is much, much more animated. And then you get correspondence, pamphlets, et cetera. So in terms of the press, you cannot understand the O'Connellite agitation unless you go to the National Library and you look at the microfilms of the pilot. Now, the pilot was a openly pro-O'Connellite newspaper. You then secondly cannot do anything concerning this period unless you look at the Dublin Evening Post, which has a, 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 an honorable history of a liberal newspaper and going way back to the 1780s and 90s, I'm astounded to see serious academic work that doesn't quote the Dublin Evening Post. The Freeman's Journal, as many people and no one better than Felix Larkin would tell you, all through its history, its political allegiances wavered, but at this particular period of time, um, it's, it's quite respectful of O'Connell. So there's another theater of politics, and that's the down on the keys, the corn exchange, where the O'Connellite, the repeal uh, meetings are happening. So there's a deconstruction of everything that O'Connell is doing as Lord Mayor 
amongst his own political associates with ladies up in the gallery going on at the corn exchange. But obviously they're not keeping minutes. We don't have official or even semi-official meetings, uh, minute books. But that's where the raw politics and that's where he's expressing himself. And that's where he says, yes, of course, I'll go up to the new viceroy, the new Lord Lieutenant at his first levy and pay my respects as Lord Mayor. Why shouldn't I? But I'm not going to kowtow to his Tory uh, stroke orangist politics. So to really get a feel, you would need to look at the, the supportive press, the kind of middle of ground press, the anti O'Connellite press, correspondence and any pamphlets or surveys uh, or reports arising out of what Dublin City Council is trying to do to expand its ambit. And all of this I discovered in the past week doing my research in an absolutely wonderful thesis um, online, which is Stephanie Jones, Transformation of Municipal Governance of a Victorian City, 1840 to 1860. The thesis has been put up by Trinity, but it's to be treated uh, with respect and the author credited. Uh, and she explains the total background to this particular period, admitting it was neglected. So obviously Stephanie Jones is quoted in David Dixon's Dublin. He has three or four pages, very relevant. Uh, Jacqueline Hill, an absolute classic of a book from Patriots to Unionists. Now she ends with this period of municipal change, uh, but she explains some of the um, clashes between the old system and the new system because there is an overlap. When they have that election in October, they don't replace all the aldermen as they were called. So you have the already in place aldermen and new councillors. And then there's a very general, very incisive book uh, by Matthew Potter, Municipal Revolution in Ireland. So it's not until you look at all of those sources and you then go back into the minute book of Dublin City Council that some things begin to make more sense. So for example, they had too many officers. They were told that they needed to streamline. Um, a subcommittee was formed. Whose job are we going to ax? Uh, we then need to compensate them. Um, were they doing their job efficiently? Uh, were they, you know, a lot of these jobs involved a financial dimension that had to be accounted for. And so this needed to be scrutinized. So all of this O'Connell took very seriously, but you really get a very superficial sense of his role. It's really almost as if he's chairing meetings and that's it, and then signing um, the minutes. So in terms of high excitement of O'Connell being groundbreaking, you will be disappointed if that's what you're looking for, but there are other bonuses. So we're just gonna move to slide number five, Parag. So here it is, it's transcribed text um, of the moment when he's elected Lord Mayor. So when I got the email uh, at the end of February, beginning of March, um, you know, I kind of read it. And then when it explained that it starts with the election of O'Connell, I said, I'm not missing this. I was not yet full-time back at work, uh, but my brain was beginning, you know, the airwaves were beginning to connect uh, with reality. Um, so I was able to take some time off and start the transcription. And it was just exciting uh, to do this particular moment. And after about 10 lines, I realized this is as boring as watching paint dry, um, but nonetheless, that's what it is. And of course, by trial and terror, I was learning about the enrichments. I'll get onto a few that I added, um, locations. I'm not terribly, uh, you know, digital and Facebooky anyway to start with, but I understand now um, there's a few, it's always the same things that you're doing. And I just tripped over a few people that I thought it would be interesting to uh, have some enhancements for. So if you have good eyesight and we're gonna move very swiftly onwards uh, without any commentary 
there was an alderman Kinnahan uh, in um, place, uh, very conservative at the time. So next slide. Okay, so on the very first page of the register, which begins on the 1st of November, that particular meeting when O'Connell is elected Lord Mayor. And then they get on with the business they have to get on with. Um, someone much later pasted this pamphlet. So I had overlooked this at the beginning. It irritated me because I wanted to see the names of the councillors. Now that, you know, at the beginning of each meeting, they have the names of the councillors. Did I recognize any names? You know, hardline Tories, Orangemen, or for example, um, people I had no, known to have been supporters of O'Connell, but didn't realize they had become city councillors. But what's very interesting between the very dry election of O'Connell, like it doesn't even register applause or cheers, none of that. Uh, this pamphlet called The Citizen is absolutely redolent with glowing with support and claiming to be liberal. So here you see it says the reign of sect is over. Religious liberty has at last become the operative law of the land. It is a great thing that has come to pass at length in our emancipated metropolis. So they then, the um, local councillors who voted liberal would have been people of a weak faction, of a weak tendency, but then they refer to Orangemen as Orangemen which is really not very enlightened because they were probably all conservatives. So you should have put conservatives and not something that's that biased. So when you see the citizen pamphlet, um, it's quite extraordinary. So I had totally neglected up in the left-hand corner and I'm gonna add an enrichment uh, soon to the website. It says the pamphlet was donated by um, an assistant city accountant or something with his name uh, and they pasted it in around 1913. So it's interesting to have someone uh, revisiting. Okay, we're gonna move on to the next slide. Um, so here you have very standard, just Daniel O'Connell signing the minutes. Um, he does promise that he will issue both party and partisanship during his term. He wants to be impartial. He wants to conciliate rather than antagonize. And he makes that point. Uh, he insists that a Protestant should succeed him when his term comes to an end. And indeed, as Stephanie Jones has in her thesis, there will be an alternation of a Catholic and a Protestant Lord Mayor for the next 40 years. Um, this still doesn't impress me because my personal background, I'm half French, half American. I'm a, a classical Republican in the 18th century term. I just think all of this should be completely outside of politics and not even mentioned um, as it will be in much later years. But nonetheless, they're tenaciously hanging on to this us or them type of identity politics. Now the much wider context is the agitation of the O'Connellites to repeal the Act of Union. Now, when you look at what all the Irish O'Connellites are doing in the House of Commons in London, there's a huge amount of debate about many, many other things. The tithes, the coercion bill, uh, very quickly, they're going to have the famine to deal with. So they are dealing with layers and layers of what O'Connell calls justice for Ireland. And we need to remember that Dublin elected two MPs to the House of Commons. And unfortunately for them at this particular time, they were both uh, Tories. So if you scratch below the surface and you're looking for it, you're going to see that political identities are very often self-described by the actors of history as liberal versus conservative. O'Connell becomes an MP at the beginning of a groundbreaking reform movement in British politics. So we need to look much further than beyond the labels of orange um, and the emerging green. 
Okay, we're gonna move on to slide number eight, Parag. And these are what I'm gonna call the side stories. I hadn't looked at this back in March when I was transcribing, but last week when I started, that's the second or third image that you see. The first image is the gray box, which Parag would be familiar with them with a typed label explaining where the register would have been kept on what shelf. So that's a modern ID marking. Um, but then you open the gray cover box and then you see this exquisite um, label, uh, book plate of the printer John Chambers. So when I looked at this quickly last week, I said, hold on just one second. But of course, it's John Chambers Jr. So, to anyone familiar with the period of the United Irishman and the history of Theobald Wolftone and of Catholic emancipation, the very early years of it in the 1780s and attempts to bring it even further in the 1790s, um, which will fail in terms of um, what O'Connell and his often liberal Protestant associates will achieve in the 1820s, which is the parliamentary representation for Catholics. John Chambers that we knew was a very radical printer, a very much a liberal progressive. He will champion in the guilds, in St. Luke's Guild, the cause of Catholic printers. You can read about this in the Dictionary of Irish Biography. I worked for a year for the DIB after my PhD. So that's why all these side people, I think it's very important to document because a lot of it weaves together. Um, he will in Dublin uh, reprint Tone's argument on behalf of the Catholics of Ireland. John Chambers is a radical United Irishman. He will be exiled first to Fort George in Scotland and then to the US. His son remains in Ireland and will take over the business, and that's his book plate. So he's actually seems to have the gig. Um, it was the Grierson in the previous period, you know, who print all the Dublin Castle stuff, all the Lord Lieutenant's proclamations. But it's very interesting to see this kind of tenuous connection. But nonetheless, anyone who knows the period of the 1780s and 90s, when O'Connell was had just returned from London as a lawyer with his law degree fresh, the ink was still fresh on it. He arrives, you know, as the rebellion is starting. So very interesting to see that. And obviously a beautiful professional business um, book play. So there are other little stories that emerge. Uh, one of the aldermen, local councillors who will speak frequently is the very young Isaac Butt. And of course, he will eventually become a prototype for a home ruler. You know, his career will change, but he's still very much on the side of the conservatives at that period of time. Nonetheless, he's part of Dublin's history. The overlap between the old unaccountable loyalist um, corporation and the new Dublin City Council. Now, on the 1st of December, 1841, there's an interesting entry. They refer to a James Houghton who had written letters asking if there was any premises in Dublin that could be leased for the Dublin Mechanics Institute, which was like, you know, a community college nowadays where you could, or a college of further education where working men could acquire further skills or improve their literacy or read newspapers or probably occasionally be indoctrinated politically. So James Houghton was going around looking for premises. He was on the board of the Mechanics Institute and the councillors agreed, you know, this is a very worthy enterprise and we need to help them. So I added an enrichment. I said, I'm not gonna let this one go um, as to who James Houghton was. Because James Houghton, I had come across when I was teaching the O'Connell course, because he's a leading champion of abolishing slavery in Ireland. He was a, a dissenter, a nonconformist. Um, and Houghton appears 
in the beginning when O'Connell is kind of recruited into the anti-slavery movement. And as we now know, Dublin City Council is very much aware that Frederick Douglass's visit to Ireland was hugely significant. Now, obviously it was Obama's speech on College Green that for many people put that on the record, but we were already aware of that because Lawrence Fenton, a journalist, has written an exceptional book on the time the escaped slave originally from Maryland, Frederick Douglass spent in Dublin and in Ireland. Uh, in fact, he spoke at what was then still the Royal Exchange, which then became City Hall. He had previously spoken at a Quaker meeting house and Houghton would have been one of those dissenters, Quakers and Unitarians who helped invite Frederick Douglass. So it was very interesting to see him here in another capacity, wanting to assist um, working men to broaden their skills in a Dublin Mechanics Institute. Um, there's also, by coincidence, in that same entry for the 1st of December 1841, a discussion about bronzing the statue of King William III, which used to be right in the middle of College Green, more or less between H&M in the old Hibernian Bank and the taxi rank at Foster's Place. So the whole reason behind bronzing it was so that it wouldn't be painted over with orange paint or green paint, uh, whatever. So it's quite interesting to see these different layers of Dublin's history and someone obscure like James Houghton, who's not that obscure because he's a mover and shaker in other ways. Um, not only during the campaign to abolish slavery in the British Empire in the 1830s, but when they succeed in that, they then move on to universal ab abolition uh, and take on the Americans. So someone like James Houghton, in that book about Frederick Douglass by Lawrence Fenton, he appears absolutely everywhere. Um, I'm nearly at the end, Parikh. We're gonna move to the final two slides. So a few years later, O'Connell and his supporters will hold what they call a national levee at what's now the Gate Theatre at the Rotunda. And it's not really been written up properly. It's an extraordinary event. It's very bizarre. Many of the young men who are in their 20s who attend are later begun to become Fenians or IRB. It's quite extraordinary. But the Punch in 1842 will uh, publish this cartoon and that's the former Prime Minister Peel uh, with whom O'Connell had had many clashes. Now this event never happened, but it's just an absolutely extraordinary um, cartoon. And the title of the cartoon is The Uncrowned Monarch of Ireland. So once again, I think it's important to understand the heroization of O'Connell, but equally to look at the facts of history. And this was a very transformative period. And people are a little bit afraid of personality cults now, but he had an extraordinary character and he attracted a lot of attention. He had very effective people working around him, some of whom uh, are obscure, one of whom I picked up had been elected a city councillor. Um, so it's important to look at all aspects of history and not to feel, oh yeah, our great grandfathers used to adulate him. No, no, we don't do that nowadays. Um, just the final slide. This magnificent statue in City Hall, which is now mostly closed to the public. Um, I know Pari can't do anything about that, but it's uh, it had been opened up for the millennium to the people, and now it's um, regularly, for understandable material reasons, rented out for weddings. Uh, but that angle of the statue, it's almost impossible for the public to see it. What we need to remember is this statue was started while O'Connell was still alive. And to be immortalized, looking very much like a noble Roman in your lifetime um, is exceptional. 
So that's not how I end final slide Parag is just to thank you very much and all your colleagues behind the scene and anyone else who's taken part in the transcribathon. Um, and I very much hope you can add to what I've just contributed any thoughts. Um, and of course, if you do have any questions, I'll be very glad to answer them. So once again, thanks so much on this hot day um, for taking the time to join us.